This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Now we're going to look at marketing. But so that we understand what the marketing approach means, uh, we have to look at certain other approaches that companies can take to trying to sell their products. And the first we have here is a product-led approach. This is a company maybe headed up by a couple of very clever engineers. They take great pride in the, uh, the cleverness, the innovation and the quality perhaps of what they're making. Uh, but unfortunately what they're making may not be what the public wants or it may be made too well. It may be over-engineered so the price is too high. They make good products but they might not sell. The production-led approach uh, is where uh, the company concentrates on uh, producing very, very efficiently, no idle time, wastage and so on. Uh, but all that might happen there is it produces goods which are then very efficiently kind of stored in the inventories and don't sell very well. Then we have the sales-led approach. The sales-led approach is uh, really characterized by a very uh, high-pressured sales uh, team uh, almost forcing people to buy uh, goods and services which they don't want. There have been n notorious cases uh, of that in the past. One was the concept of a timeshare. This was uh, popular during the 1980s, during 1990s, in a lot of uh, Spain and Canary Isles, uh, where people, speculators, put up apartments, and instead of selling a whole apartment to somebody for the holidays, because, of course, that means uh, you have the apartment the whole year because maybe you only use it for two or three weeks. They had this timeshare concept uh, where you would buy maybe the first two weeks in July, but you would have that available for the next 99 years. Then somebody else would have it for the last two weeks in July and so on. And if you put up, uh, let's say, uh, even just a thousand apartments and you divide that into weeks, then you've got about 50,000 units to sell uh, at that quite an expensive price uh, and maybe they're, they're a kind of concept that people weren't very happy with. And these uh, salespeople used to go up and down beaches uh, almost hijacking innocent holiday makers, taking away in a coach for a presentation and almost holding them hostage until they would sign the dotted line promising to buy one of these apartments. So sales-led uh, and sales is not the same as marketing. Sales that is is really pushing articles on people that they're maybe not absolutely convinced about. Marketing led is quite different. Marketing is a very kind of humble occupation, though you may not think of it like that. Uh, but it is finding out what do our customers want or what do they potentially want. And then uh, what we can do is if we make these goods uh, and using research and development to establish what people want and develop the appropriate goods, uh, then really they will just, just about sell themselves. Uh, so they will you s explain to people what this will do for them, say, yes, this is what I want, you're pleasing your customer, uh, and these will just fly off the shelves. And you can see how it works for something like Apple iPhones. There's no hard sell on those, uh, but they have produced a product which you know, people queue around the block to, to try to buy. So marketing is not us imposing our views on uh, customers. It is finding out what customers want uh, and tailoring our products to that. It's not completely passive. Customers may not know what they want. So within marketing, within the research that you have, you may produce uh, prototype products, show them to customers and so on, and uh, see what they uh, think of those and then if they think they're good then you can go into full-scale production. Now what are the stages in marketing? And the first stage is uh, market segmentation uh, and this is recognizing that most markets are not homogeneous, they're not all of exactly the same people wanting exactly the same things. Uh, different people, uh, maybe at different ages, uh, want different sorts of articles. You just have to think of clothing uh, obviously, male and females want different sorts of products. Lifestyle. So, uh, again, in clothing, uh, sometimes you want casual clothes. Uh, sometimes you want more formal clothes. 
and, and there may be different shops and outlets and indeed uh, makes, if you like, uh, which uh, furnish those different segments of uh, the population with what they need. Wealth. Uh, we know you can buy expensive suits, you can buy cheaper suits. Uh, and, and there's going to be a range of uh, what, what people want to pay for these. And even geography. Uh, in food, for example, there are often regional differences. In clothing, there are obviously regional differences depending on the local climate. So what you do is you have to study the segment, see how it could be logically split up. Uh, and at some stage, we're going to have to think about what segments we want to address. Uh, we might find that a particular segment is, is very competitive and it's going to be quite hard to get in there. Or we might find another segment isn't very profitable. Or perhaps another segment is actually difficult to reach the customers, it's difficult to find them. And uh, we may decide not to necessarily approach every segment or produce goods for every segment. After that comes the uh, uh, market uh, targeting. This is deciding what products uh, we're going to aim really uh, at particular segments of the market. And the first type is known as undifferentiated market targeting. Uh, and this is really where one product does all. So we're not actually recognizing that there are different segments uh, within the market. Uh, it, it is a homogeneous market. And it's terribly difficult to find a, a product uh, which will fit into that. Even something as basic as water, we know you can buy it out of the tap. Uh, you can buy different brands of mineral water. You can buy with gas, without gas. You can buy big bottles, little bottles, and, uh, and so on. What people are doing is saying, well, there are actually different segments of the uh, purchases uh, and one will not fit all. So this this is more of a kind of theoretical uh, concept uh, and most things will go to differentiated market targeting. Well basically what you have is product one, product two, product three going to different market segments, designed for different market segments. And you see this every time you go uh, shopping. Uh, you go going to uh, buy some uh, shampoo, for example. You get big family bottles. You get little ones for traveling. You get shampoo for dry hair. You get shampoo for red hair. You get shampoo for greasy hair. Uh, you maybe get shampoo for no hair. Uh, but what the, the marketing people are saying is we will sub-segment the, the, the market and we make a product just right for them. Then, then that will grab their attention and it will sell very well. There's almost in some cases a, an over proliferation of products uh, so that in sometimes making a decision becomes kind of quite difficult and you have to be careful actually not to scare off potential purchases. And then we have uh, concentrated market targeting. Uh, and this is really the marketing name for what you might call a focus uh, strategy where you just concentrate on one segment. You may have heard of the, the, the word niche marketing. Uh, well, maybe the uh, the firm is so small that it can't you know, provide four products for four different segments. It says, right, I will just concentrate on that segment, make sure I make the perfect product for that segment uh, and get great buyer loyalty and, and quite good profits because the product suits them so perfectly. So we know we may have a number of segments to aim at, to target. How do we go about actually aiming accurately at a particular segment? Uh, and this is known as product positioning. Uh, product positioning was really invented around the, the 1950s by a guy called McCarthy. And initially uh, he had just four elements in that. Uh, we have got the, the, the four P's uh, there. And this was basically for physical products. Because in the, the 1950s, it was a sale of physical products, things that made up the, the vast bulk of the economy. And then it was uh, extended uh, somewhat later into seven P's. And what we have here is really for the, uh, the marketing of services. 
And I'll just mention why the extra three have been put on here. First of all, people, uh, if you're selling a service, then the chances are that the company selling the service, their staff have more interaction with the buyer. A service like uh, maybe uh, uh, an air, airline services, uh, flights. Uh, you interact with the uh, the staff uh, in check-in, you interact with the staff on the aircraft. Uh, another one could be in hotels, you interact with the reception staff, the dining room staff and so on. Whereas in a manufacturing business, uh, you might never meet anyone uh, on the staff of the manufacturer. Uh, they, the bad ones, if you like, can be kind of hidden away in the factory. Uh, but uh, with services, you meet the people and you have to be careful that these people uh, don't do damage. They have to be of the right caliber. They have to be trained well. Uh, process. What is the process of uh, getting the service? Uh, how easy is it to maybe navigate through an internet uh, uh, sales site to book your flight, book your hotel and uh, so on? Uh, and, and then physical evidence. Uh, at least if you buy a physical product, you often leave with that in your hands. Uh, but if you are buying a service, if you're booking a flight, how do you know it's really been booked? And you have to make sure, for example, that uh, you maybe get an email uh, for confirmation. Uh, so three extra ones, uh, which we're not going to talk about very much again, having mentioned that they are important for services. So let's see what's on the heading of product. And under the heading of product it is basically what the thing does, what it looks like, what its quality is, what its brand is. So if you, you buy a phone, uh, you can buy you know, a very simple non-smartphone. You can buy a phone with GPS, you can buy a phone with or without radio and so on. Uh, these are known as its features. Uh, quality is there. Uh, we like a choice perhaps of a high quality and probably high priced item or maybe a low quality, lower priced item. Uh, and, and maybe we, 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 depending when we're buying, what we're buying for, we maybe change our choice. The design can be very important. I keep going back to Apple, but the, the, the design standards of Apple make their products look really, really good, really cool, as a judge once said. Uh, and uh, so on. And again, people may be willing to pay a premium for the design. The brand, uh, people often pay irrational amounts to get hold of a particularly uh, popular brand. I mentioned already, I think, t-shirts. Uh, you can buy nearly identical t-shirts at vastly different prices, uh, and you pay the high price, not so much maybe because the quality is that much higher, but because it has a logo uh, on the t-shirt and I suppose people like to show off. And then packaging. Uh, packaging very important for some products. If you look at cosmetics, uh, look at uh, perfume, uh, very often it looks as though the uh, packaging is probably more expensive to produce than the contents. But it all goes together as the, the offering, if you like, which has been made uh, to the customers. Price. Uh, the uh, examiner has said that uh, for us, price is by far the most important of the four P's. We are accountants, we should know about price. Uh, and also price is the fastest of the, of the four P's to change. You can't change a product very quickly without going through redesign, for example. But if something's not selling well, you can slash the prices more or less instantly. Uh, there will uh, be another chapter in this just following where we go into price and price setting in just a little bit more uh, detail, but we can kind of cover some of it uh, here, uh, perhaps. First of all, there is the price level. Uh, should we be selling this at $10, $15, $20 and so on? Some of this will depend on competition. Some of it may depend on the brand. Some of it may depend on the quality and so on. Uh, but uh, we have to make a decision about the price level. Discounts, very important in business to business where people buy huge volumes of uh, products. And if they buy huge volumes of products, uh, then they expect a discount. But it's also important uh, sometimes in business to consumer markets, uh, there is the, you know, the, you know, the, the two for one sort of offer that you get. That's a discount. 
uh, or buy one get one half price that's essentially a discount uh, and we we have to think what what might be suitable terms terms is an interesting one by and large if you're as a consumer buying something you tend to pay cash or at least with your credit card uh, if you are a business buying then you're probably going to get your standard 30 days credit uh, but it can be more sophisticated than that. You can actually use the terms to make yourself very attractive uh, to a particular segment of the market. So let's say that you were selling uh, agricultural chemicals and you were selling to farmers. So agricultural chemicals, seeds, maybe insecticides, those sort of things. Farmers, by and large, uh, are going to be thinking of buying those in springtime. That's when they need the seeds, that's when they need the artificial fertilizer uh, to make the crops grow. So there's a big outflow springtime, then over summer the crops grow, and then in autumn the crops are harvested and the farmer eventually gets the cash flow back. Now this uh, very cyclical cash flow can put farmers into some difficulty with their cash flow management. And very often it's funded, of course, by going to your bank and getting an overdraft. However, think uh, of a supplier of these agricultural chemicals who says to the farmer, look, you buy this from me in spring and you don't have to pay until the autumn. We will extend you credit for four months, six months, whatever it takes. Think how attractive that offer would be to the farmer uh, the farmer might even be willing to pay a slightly higher price uh, to get rid of the bother of going to the bank and arranging an overdraft. And finally, we have uh, strategic pricing. Strategic pricing, first of all, is price skimming. Price skimming, you see it a lot in uh, new technology. Uh, when, for example, three dimension, 3D televisions were brought out, uh, the price uh, it's in the UK is probably about £1,500 uh, because there were some people out there who would spend £1,500 on that new technology or, or maybe they needed it desperately for some reason. And then when you use up those that layer of very rich people or perhaps uh, very stupid people, you come down to a layer who might spend 1400 and then down to a layer who would spend 1300 and, and so on. So price skimming means go in with a very high price uh, but you expect this price to be gradually brought down to some kind of stable level after a while. Penetration pricing is essentially the reverse. Uh, penetration pricing is where you win with a very low price. Uh, and the hope is with this very low price, we can get it to a, a, a right here, very low price, and I can write. At very low price, you're going to get a very high sales volume. And if you get a very high sales volume, then you might get a very low cost. And the very low cost might allow you to sustain the very low price. You get a kind of uh, circle going around here, a virtuous circle. A low cost is enabling you to keep the low price. A low price is enabling you to keep the high market share. So that could be permanent and a very high market share and a low price can be a barrier to entry. Somebody else coming into the market which you've got such dominance in is going to find it really quite hard to make a profit. And then we have related product pricing. Uh, one sort of related product pricing I think can be seen in inkjet printers. You sell people the inkjet printer maybe for $80 and then in a couple of months, when they go to uh, replace the cartridges, uh, the cartridges cost about $75. The idea is once you've got them hooked on the basic product, you're really going to make your money on the consumables. Another example of related product pricing is in range of cars. So you can see uh, maybe an advert saying, let, I don't know what the proper price is, but let's say you see an advert saying Ford Focus from 10,000. So you go to the garage thinking this is a good price and you see this Ford Focus for 10,000 and you discover that, you know, everything's manual. Uh, no, um, no music system, no 
air conditioning, no power steering, uh, really underpowered engine and, and so on. Uh, and that's not really a car that you'd particularly want to buy. So you ask to see the next one. Uh, maybe the next car you see, basically one was 10,000, let's say this one you see is maybe 14,000. And now we're talking, this is a car you would quite like. Uh, electric windows, uh, air conditioning, music system, decent size engine and so on. And marketing people know this helps you make the choice uh, because really you've established that 10,000 is the lowest price and for that you would get a car you don't want. Uh, and what you kind of concentrate on then is, is in a way the 4,000. For another 4,000 I get a car I do want. And then sometimes they will pitch in a very expensive car, the upper model of maybe 20,000, uh, with all sorts of fancy engines and exhaust pipes and paint jobs and so on. And you say to yourself, no, I won't go there. Uh, that's too expensive. And, and you get a, a your, your kind of conscience is almost kind of relieved that you've made a very sensible middle of the road um, choice uh, in going for the car at 14,000. But we'll come back to price. Next we have promotion. And promotion includes advertising, uh, but, but much more. Uh, advertising uh, in the press, on television, and as I mentioned, I think, in an earlier uh, chapter, advertising uh, increasingly uh, seen and increasingly important uh, in uh, the internet. Advertisers love it uh, because very often it's uh, volunteers really in the internet. You, you've typed in a keyword uh, and Google picks up what you're interested in and then feeds adverts of the right sort to you. Advertisers can track everything you do uh, and they only pay if you click through on their adverts. And this has stolen a huge amount of revenue from television. You have to think where suitable advertising sites might be if you are uh, advertising very specialist product, then you wouldn't go to television. Internet would be fine, specialist magazines would be fine. If you're advertising products that are going to be uh, potentially bought by a huge range of people, uh, then television may be the most viable way of reaching a huge number of uh, potential customers. Sales promotion. Uh, sales promotion happens very close to the act of uh, buying. Uh, sometimes in supermarkets, uh, you see people, uh, they've got, you know, little bits of cheese or something for you to try or little bits of chocolate for you to try. That is sales promotion. So is a buy one, get one free uh, kind of offering. That's often regarded as a form of sales promotion as, as well. Personal selling means a salesperson, a salesman or a saleswoman who comes to you, spends time with you and tries to sell you a product. It's a universal in business to business. That's what the sales force does. It goes around the customers trying to drum up business. You only get it in business to consumer if the item being sold is big enough really to, uh, uh, I suppose, support the profit and is big enough to support the salesperson's wages. So you won't get uh, somebody desperately trying to sell you a bar of chocolate but you may get somebody desperately trying to sell you a car because a profit in a car is economically, makes it economically worthwhile to pay a salesperson. And finally, there's public relations or PR, a good mention in the press. Uh, for example, a, a company making a donation to charity or a company uh, perhaps sponsoring the local soccer team gets their names on the, the back of the jerseys and so on. Not usually maybe advertising specific products, uh, but keeping the name of the company um, in, in, in people's attention and hopefully creating a favourable impression about that. Just before we leave, uh, promotion worth uh, mentioning two uh, types of promotion. There's pool promotion and push promotion. So we think about push promotion. Let's say you had a, a new chocolate bar uh, that you were the manufacturer of, what you have to do is you have to make sure that the the shops selling uh, chocolate, uh, that they are going to stock that. So you go around, this would be personal selling, 
uh, and you would push these products into the shop. You'd say to the shopkeeper, this is going to be a big success. And then uh, you want the customers uh, coming in. Uh, and the customers here, uh, this is going to be what they call pool uh, promotion. So in here, we're going to have uh, the pool. Let me just see if I can write with this mouse. I can give up in a minute. So uh, they go in and say, have you got that chocolate bar? In a way, their demand is pulling it into the shop. So push it into the shop from the manufacturer, pull it into the shop from the consumers. And you want both of those to match up. There is no point in launching a new chocolate bar if all that happens uh, is that uh, customers see this being advertised on television, they go into the shop and it's not there. Uh, or if it's pushed into the shop and nobody actually notices the new chocolate bar because it hasn't been advertised on television. They both, they must kind of marry up this push and pull promotion uh, so that it all works. And then uh, we have place, the fourth of the four P's. The place you go to buy it is really distribution. And we have to think of uh, a number of considerations. Uh, what should be the length of the distribution chain? And the shortest length of distribution chain is manufacturer to customer. This is sometimes called direct marketing. There's no middleman at all, no shop really at all. Uh, and this uh, was often used, still is to some extent, when buying computers. You can buy a laptop directly from the manufacturer. And because it's only the manufacturer who needs profit, it can be a very cheap way of buying the product. However, it works well for computers because they can be perfectly specified and described in terms of memory and speed and, 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 and so on. It doesn't work this uh, uh, direct marketing manufacturer to consumer just as well for something like clothing. Although you can uh, produce catalogues, you can show the clothes in the internet and so on. Uh, when the clothes arrive and you try them on, you find it doesn't quite fit, or you don't quite like the colour. Uh, and for those sorts of uh, operation, about 50% of what's purchased over the internet will be sent back as unsuitable. That's a considerable cost uh, for those suppliers. The longest type of distribution chain is going to be manufacturer to wholesaler to retailer to consumer. The traditional way in which goods get into, if you like, corner shops. Three people need profits, manufacturer, the wholesaler and the retailer. So the goods, when they get to the, uh, the end seller, the corner shop, are going to be quite expensive. But what this does allow is for the goods to be very widely distributed in the community. Every little shop will have these goods. And if, for example, you were selling ch certain sorts of chocolate bar, that's what you need because people are not going to travel you know a long way to get a particular make of chocolate bar your chocolate bar has to have this very wide kind of distribution network otherwise you're going to begin losing sales we need to think about the types of goods and the suitability of the outlet as well uh, if you have uh, luxury upmarket goods then the outlet has to be one uh, which kind of suits those goods in the right place with the right people in it with the right kind of decoration in it. If you're selling uh, cheaper goods, then maybe you could sell them just through a, a supermarket or a more ordinary shop. But the place has to fit. Uh, uh, the, the type of goods has to be suitable for the type of goods which you're trying to sell. 